Hi everybody, welcome to my talk here about closing the developer experience gap of your container platforms. My name is Timo Salm and I'm a preset specialist for developer experience at VMware with a main focus on our internal developer platforms running on Kubernetes and the commercial Spring products. Before we start talking about technologies, let's first have a look why we need them. And um, in the traditional software development process, it was really like the illustration below. So the software was handed over to the operations teams that were responsible for deploying the application, supporting it, and doing also a day two of it. Long release cycles led to increased project risk and um, increased costs also. And because of that, modern software development um, moved from an, agile, uh, from an waterfall process more towards an agile um, approach. And also, um, huge applications, huge complex applications were split down into smaller, loosely coupled microservices implemented by smaller teams. Because of the fact that operations of such applications is a lot more complex than those monolithic applications, there's really a need um, for collaboration between developers and operation teams, which is uh, called a DevOps culture, and supported by automation and self-service capabilities. Also, regarding those deployments, it's important that you have rapid application deployment and provisioning capabilities to be able to release your application fast and early. And um, for that, we have, for example, technologies like um, CI, CD, containers, and Kubernetes. Because of the fact that, um, yeah, developers or application teams are now responsible for the full lifecycle of the applications, they need a solid observability solution because at the end, it doesn't mean that they are responsible for deploying the applications, et cetera. That should be still um, the responsi responsibility of the operators. For sure, there are things like you build it, you run it, at, but at most of the organization, that doesn't work because of the missing expertise. If we talk about Kubernetes, so a container orchestration solution, it not only provides uh, the benefit of shortened software development cycles, it also provides additional um, benefits like improved resource utilization compared to a virtual machine, and also, for example, reduced costs. The fact that Kubernetes is now the infrastructure abstraction standard comes from um, its capability to uh, be available on more or less any modern or any infrastructure, so from on-premises to public cloud, and because of that, Kubernetes is the de facto infrastructure um, de facto infrastructure abstraction standard. Kubernetes also provides a really huge ecosystem of tools, and I, you may have seen some of them already here, or uh, in, in uh, yeah, the CNCF landscape. And um, yeah, Kubernetes really provides for software development a low abstraction, or too low abstraction, and especially if your application is building applications at scale, so a lot of teams working on applications, it's far too low for them. And um, yeah, you should consolidate that and provide a higher abstraction. Kubernetes, with all the ecosystem around that and missing capabilities you actually need to run applications at scale, is more a tool to build a platform than a platform itself. If we have a look at the developer experience of Kubernetes, developers nowadays in most of the organizations, they are responsible for defining the container image, with a Docker file, as you can see in here, um, for example, with a Spring Boot application, it's just about four lines of code, and then you um, have to package the container, push it to a registry, and then, then you are able to run your application via interactive commands or uh, via YAML, so it's really easy to get your application running. But um, to run it in a secure way and really at production, there's a lot more to do. So you have to define the ingress, you have to define TLS, you have to define the scaling, and a lot more, and therefore it's not, um, or most of the developers don't have enough expertise to do that really in a secure way. And especially, as already mentioned, if you're um, implementing or developing software at scale, a lot of time um, will be consumed to define this stuff. And um, yeah, every second developers are spending on um, working on those infrastructure specifics, they are not able to provide any business value because the only business value that they can provide comes, out, um, comes um, if they add new functionality to the software or, for example, fix bugs. Kelsey Hightower, one of the VIPs of Kubernetes, just mentioned in March that the experience, so 
he's talking about the future of Kubernetes, should be like that the developers, they just define or provide their source code, define some minimal configuration, like for example, which data services they need, and then the platform should um, configure everything for them that the application just runs. So container building, etc., all this stuff should be abstracted away for them because they are infrastructure specifics. And if I'm coming back to those containers and Docker files, would any operator ever thought about in the past that a developer defines the virtual machine image where the application is running on and which WebSphere version um, it, it should use? I don't think that that was the case and it shouldn't be the case. Such an experience, we call it an app-aware platform. So the developers don't have to adapt uh, their application for a specific infrastructure in, instead of also with a um, uh, higher abstractions or abstractions uh, frameworks like, for example, Spring Boot provide to developers. They shouldn't about care about the infrastructure and the platform is then able to uh, um, use the software code and package it accordingly that it can run on its infrastructure. And most of the cases or most Kubernetes platforms I see at our customers, it's more like on the left. So the platform um, exposes a lot of infrastructure specifics, which shouldn't be the case. Now we will have a look at several solutions to abstract away infrastructure specifics and um, that you can start providing an app aware uh, platform experience now. As you can see on the left, that's um, the already mentioned really uh, basic example of running a Spring Boot application um, uh, as a container. And yeah, if you search it at Google, you can get um, this uh, four lines of code within seconds. But as I said, this is not secure in any way, and it's also like um, not how a best practice uh, Spring application should be packaged in a container. On the right, you see an example of how it's a little bit a better uh, way of creating that container. So first, it starts, starts with uh, choosing the right base image. So uh, which is the right JDK? Also, the version you can see, Java um, 8 versus uh, 17, which is a, um, a supported uh, long-term release. Compared to the 8 one, it's not supported anymore. Also, that you, for example, in best case here, would um, define the digits so that you really can show it's um, a specific container image and um, also, um, uh, um, yeah, ensure in a way uh, that, that, that you know what, what's in the base image. And then you can see it's, for example, using a functionality Spring provides as a layer char um, uh, here, where um, the business code is in a different layer than the dependencies because the business code uh, changed more fre frequently than the dependencies. And with that and caching mechanisms of, for example, the registry um, and the Docker runtime, you're saving a lot of disk space. And also, um, um, it's a lot faster to pull and push those images, and that's not only on your local laptop, also on the Kubernetes nodes. You can also so see we are using a multi-stage build here, so with that you um, also in a way uh, reduce the attack vectors, because you're not including all the files and um, the JDK into the image, and um, this also makes the image lots, uh, um, short, um, uh, uh, smaller. So the question is, how can we, in a way, abstract that away? And um, as mentioned, it's not a best practice that the developers define how the applications run. They need the flexibility um, regarding languages and frameworks they can use. And um, yeah, for that um, a problem um, of defining the base image and putting together the container image, Heroku and Pivotal together created the cloud native uh, build pack standard. The idea of cloud native build packs is that those build packs for specific languages and capabilities of your container image, they detect based on the source code whether they can contribute something to the container image. So like, for example, if you have a Spring Boot, boot cloud native build pack or parts of it, they can detect, oh, it's Maven because of the POM XML, and then it knows, so the Maven build pack then knows how to build the application, so running Maven package, for example. Also, there is a JRE build pack that then knows, oh, it's a Java application, so I can provide the runtime for it. And um, with those different build packs, then at the end, the developer don't have to specify anything, maybe some configuration properties like, okay, I want to use this um, version of the JRE, but uh, most of the stuff is abstracted away, and those build packs are responsible for building a container image, and um, then if you push it to a registry, you can deploy your application as you, you know. And it's also like that with those cloud native build packs, you have a stack, a base image coming with it. And if you then, um, for example, update both of them, you can just recreate the container image um, with those updated base images. 
So that abstracts away um, the building the container image from developers or defining it. But um, we still have the problem that, yeah, we have to build it in a way. We, there is a pack CLI available for that. But um, for um, doing that at scale, for sure you could integrate it in your CI CD. Um, we have another co uh, solution called KPAC, which at the end um, uh, abstracts away the building of your container images from source code with cloud native build packs um, in a Kubernetes cluster. So it's running in Kubernetes. Developers or the CI CD can define um, the configuration for KPAC. Um, so where is the source code? Some additional configurations maybe, and KPAC is aware of the build packs and the operating system or base images in the Kubernetes cluster. And it also has the capability, um, if there's a new base image available, for example, to rebuild the actual container images or all of them that are configured in the environment. And with that, the big benefit is not only that developers don't have to care about how the container image looks like, it also abstracts away or um, uh, uh, the, the base image updates or put it in the hand in, um, of the operators in a fully automated way. KPEG is currently not part of the CNCF, but we are um, working on contributing it um, as of right now. So I think in the next few weeks or months, it will be also a CNCF project. Here's an illustration of that. So we like if there are new build packs available, a new operating system or base image available, um, or your application source code changes, a KPEG is capable of uh, rebuilding container images or all the configured con container images in your um, uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. And um, yeah, let's have a look how that looks like. Give you an idea. So uh, instead of using YAML and putting YAML together, because that usually takes some time, I'm using a CLI for that, which is also open source. It's called the KP CLI, like KPAC. And I'm running a KP image create command. And you can see the only thing I provide is a name for it, because it's a Kubernetes resource at the end. Um, the URL where my um, source code is stored, in this case, a simple, a re really basic Spring Boot application, and a tag, so where the application should be automatically pushed to. And it's also then in the Kubernetes cluster resource, and as mentioned, if one of those aspects, like the stack or the build um, pack, will be updated, it automatically recreates an image. So that's um, not just for, for now, it, as I said, it's continuously watching whether there are updates. And um, yeah, as long as it takes to build the image, we can have a look at, um, for example, the, the image or the, the YAML that I created. I'm using a, um, a plugin here, um, exporter, so it's removing all the status stuff um, to, to uh, yeah, be able to better discover it. You can see it just has um, the source code defined, as mentioned, the tag, in addition, is it has some configuration like the cache size and the builder. The builder is really the combination of the stack and the build pack. So you can have build, multiple builders with multiple types of base images and stacks. But the idea is that a builder includes all the different technologies here, um, or build packs for the different technologies the developers want to use. And um, I can also have a look at the builder here that's running in my cluster. And you can see based on information, it has a detection order. So based on which um, order um, the, the, the build packs will be in a way um, uh, uh, or try to detect whether they are able to contribute something. And um, you can see in this um, environment, we have a variety of build packs. So they are commercial ones. But with the Paketo project, which we are also contrib contributing to, um, there is, uh, for all the different build packs you can see here, we also have open source versions available. And um, you can see they, they are really like for every, more or less every language, also a web server, one where you can, for example, build your and deploy then your Angular applications or something like that. But they are really modular, which means that you can see here, they are for every aspect of those different uh, um, languages and capabilities you usually need in a container. So from providing CA certificates to, for example, the Maven one I mentioned, mentioned or Datadoc, um, there is um, a really small build packs just focusing on one functionality more or less. And with that, you can also, instead of um, like it was before with Cloud Foundry, et cetera, rebasing them, um, you can just add your small build pack if you want to add some custom stuff uh, for your organization. If we scroll to the top, you can also see that uh, the there's a reference to the stack. In this case, 
the default uh, stack or base image here is Ubuntu Yummy, um, which we use um, with them. And um, yeah, that's really defining how your application is built. If we have a look at our image, hopefully it's built now. So list. We can see it's built. We can see the digits. And we can also, um, for sure, because at the end it's a pod running uh, the build of the container, you can also have a look via kubectl get pods, but for now we want uh, to use um, the kpcli, and there's a list command to see, the, um, to see all the builds of the Hello World application. As of right now, there's only one. Um, and also the reason, so for example, if there's a base image update, um, you see the reason of the um, stack so um, that you already uh, always know what was the reason for building that new container image. And with a logs command, we can have a look at all the logs. Where you can see, um, yeah, adding all those different layers from the different uh, build packs, like for example here the JRE, some special Spring Boot stuff that's happening, CA certificates, etc. And um, if we scroll to the beginning, you can also see how, for example, the Maven build pack just uh, built the application, um, etc. So it's really like from source code to container image without any configuration. Okay, so now we have a container image um, built for us. The next thing we want to do is we want to run our application. And for sure, we could just create a deployment, a service, an ingress, and then we have it running really easy. But uh, again, it's like, um, yeah, we have to apply a lot of uh, best practices like um, define the security context, etc. And that, as I said, is usually something developers don't have the expertise for. It's even really uh, um, yeah, hard to do that in a proper way for the operators um, that are, in best case, maybe have more expertise on uh, Kubernetes or containers uh, than the developers. And um, yeah, so we try to provide or, or use a higher abstraction on top of Kubernetes to uh, run our application. And um, yeah. What we want to use for that is a serverless runtime. And uh, serverless runtime, so let's first define what serverless is. At the end, it's like you can group it, group it into two uh, areas. The first is backend as a service, where a server side, uh, self-managed components will be replaced with all the se shell services. An example is, for example, a use um, that you use for authentication or as an authentication server, something like Okta or Auth0, where you don't have to care how it runs, etc. You just use the functionality, so it's abstracted away from you. And um, yeah, your operators have, don't have to care about it. The second thing is function as a service. It's a new way of implementing software and deploying them as uh, functions. So really small pieces that are focused on a specific functionality. And usually you use them with a, um, in an event-driven architecture so they will be um, triggered by an event and then auto-scale based on the number of events. The key of both is that at the end by um, abstracting way um, the management of server hosts or processes, you can really focus on business value. So all, of, all about what I'm talking about is about business value because every second your organization doesn't have to care about it. Um, at the end, um, you're focusing on business value or adding business value or can add business value in the time you're not uh, working on that. And um, yeah, for serverless runtime, I think most of you have heard of AWS Lambda, which is um, serverless runtime uh, uh, um, at AWS. And uh, yeah, with Knative, we have a serverless runtime running on any Kubernetes. So with that, it's not only available in the public cloud, it's also available on Kubernetes. Knative itself has several components. So the first one is serving, that's really the serverless runtime. So it provides a higher abstraction. It provides, which is typical for serverless, um, auto-scaling capabilities to scale to zero, to thousands of containers within seconds. It also has an eventing part, which is really the enabler more or less on an infrastructure side for event of architectures so or abstracting away brokers, et cetera, triggers of events. And um, last but not least, we have functions. That's a new functionality. Um, um, so really providing a functional experience like AWS Lambda with lightweight container images. And um, as I talked about, about cloud native, uh, cloud -native build packs, we are also currently working on providing that open source, those cloud native build packs together with a function experience um, for Knative because currently they are using source to image. And um, yeah, let's now have a look how uh, Knative works and how to deploy our application onto our cluster. And for that, I'm also using a CLI just uh, um, for, for, to make it easier to, to see the experience. 
So uh, KN is the CLI for it, like a native. Then uh, service create hello world. And you can see the only thing I do is define the image. For sure, there are a lot of more things you can define. So the min scale, the max scale, etc. But in our case, it's just like here's the container image deployed for me. If I run that within seconds because of let of the, okay. You can see within 11 seconds, my application is deployed. And it's also like, you can see it's HTTPS. So it by default is a TLS enabled because it's configured in my Canadian configuration. So for the full cluster. And with that, I have actually certificates that the traffic is secured. And you can provide a lot of additional um, best practices to this application. You can see I have the URL, so I can just curl it. it should be fine. Get a response. And let's also just have a second, for a second, have a look um, at, the, at the YAML file. So the resource name is k-service, um, so it's a k-native service, which is maybe not the best choice, but uh, yeah, it is like it is. And what you can see here is um, really like, okay, so here's the container image, and um, it's like, as you can see, it's a template. So at the end, it's like the pod spec, but additionally, with all the capabilities, um, you get additionally um, with the k-native, like the auto scaling, you can also see that you can split the traffic, so it can also fall back to previous revisions and um, do a blue, green, and canary deployment with Knative. In this case, because I only have one relation, uh, um, revision, 100% traffic is going to that, um, uh, to that one revision or application. If we have a look at um, what it did for us, so at all the resources it's, uh, it created, because I said it's a higher abstraction. We can find out with a, with a tree plugin, and you can see it's a lot. So first, that's a K-service, so the Kubernetes, uh, the K-native service that was created, which always uh, defines a configuration for the different revisions. Um, so if I would change something in my application, for example, or uh, yeah, just uh, define a new container, it would um, create a new revision. You can see the deployment it creates. You can see a pod autoscaler it defines, um, which you configure in K-native. You also then see um, a route configuration, which defines really how the um, ingress is, is configured, um, so the traffic from the outside and the service. So all of that stuff was generated with one, just one uh, YAML here. The next thing we want to do is really have a look at um, yeah, the auto scaling because that's one of the features of a serverless runtime. And as you can see, there's no application running because it's scaled to zero. And if I now um, go to a virtual machine here because of the fact that my uh, um, computer is not able to handle too much uh, uh, requests. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I will just um, run this uh, hey command here for a second, so not too long, because at the end it's like we can see that one is creating more, and um, yeah, I have to cancel it because it's um, sending a lot of, so thousands of requests. You can see how my uh, serverless runtime auto scales here which is um, yeah, really amazing because with that we are able to, uh, to uh, handle a lot of demand. For sure, if you're running on Kubernetes, you in a way have to upfront provision your Kubernetes cluster for that, but it's like, um, yeah, uh, if you have a lot of applications running, and usually they are not uh, all scaling up uh, in the same, um, at the same time. So that's, um, that's uh, it for our serverless runtime. The next thing I want to talk about is the ICD, because usually now you need a way to deploy, bring your source code to a container image, build a container image, deploy it, and for that uh, we have continuous integration, continuous deployment. All the common um, CI CD tools you're aware of, they have one um, or, or the same challenges, and one of them is that they are synchronous, and there's an orchestrator. So also um, a problem uh, regarding uh, the fact that if there's a problem with the orchestrator, nothing of the past production works. And in um, addition to that, um, each of the applications usually has a different path to production, even if you're using a template for that. And uh, that's a problem, because if you update something, a template, for example, add a new tool, a CVE scanner, et cetera, 
how do you uh, inform all your developers that they should add the CVE scanner? Because usually there are no mechanisms to update uh, a CI CD instance based of a template. There's usually no separation of concerns. So at organizations, maybe they split CI CD. But um, yeah, who's responsible for that is always a huge problem. And the uh, developer experience is lacking. Um, they may create a new tool for that called Cartographer, and it solves several of those problems and added new concepts. So one of them is that it's asynchronous. So like an event-driven microservice applications, application, everything is handled by events. And the big benefit of that asynchronous functionality is that, for example, if you have something like that KPEG, so for automated um, container image updates, and the capability that in a, if the base image, a new base image is available in a Kubernetes cluster, it can automatically um, recreate a container image and just send an event to that cartographer that forwards it to all the downstream steps that are inter uh, interested and run it through the path of production and deploy it. So that's really about those uh, asynchronous functionality. Other examples are CVE scanners that are continu continuously watching the uh, CVE database for new updates. We also provide, uh, provide separation of concern by a defined interface, we call it a workload, which really defines, like I said, the story before the developer says, here's my source code, here are my um, data services I automatically want to bind to. It will be applied to the cluster and every of those steps will be handed over or created for developers. So the CI, CD, the path of production is in the hand of the operators. And they don't have to care about CI, CD anymore, the developers. For sure they maybe define the test, but that's it. It works with existing tools in the Kubernetes cluster. And for integrating tools outside of the Kubernetes cluster, we have uh, we are leveraging Tekton, so a, um, yeah, a traditional CI CD system, even if it's cloud native, but uh, with those uh, challenges I said before, to, exist, um, to use the ecosystem of Tekton and uh, integrate external systems. Because of time, I will just show you for a second how, to, uh, how the developer experience looks. For that, I um, have a look at the workload YAML. This is what a developer would define. So first, we also have the concept of running every uh, specific type of application, all the applications through um, the same path to production. So any web application, whether it's an Angular application or um, a Spring Boot application, is running to the same path to production, ensuring that they are all secured in the same way and also, um, uh, yeah, um, secured in the same way and running in the same way. And um, yeah, the developer defines, okay, my application is from type web, and here is my Git repository. It could also, for example, define service bindings, automatic one, a standard created with Red Hat together, and that's it. So if I apply it to my cluster, and you can, for example, abstract it away via GitOps, or um, uh, provide developer experience via UI, and um, then if I run the tree command with my workload to see which, um, <coughs> which resources are created. I can see that it already started based on the workload. Okay, it's using Git repository. That's a Flux CD um, source controller, um, a CRD, custom resource, which fetches, continuously fetches source code from a Git repository. I have my KPEG image, which I showed you before. And after the image is built, I, it will deploy it in an easy example to Knative. So I have the full pass to production handed over or create it for, for one application instance without developer defining anything regarding that path to production. And um, yeah, the last thing developers maybe need is a nice UI, and for that, there's Backstage, it's a tool um, open source by Spotify and um, part of the CNCF. It provides some basic um, plugins, like for example, for documentation proposals and providing um, an interactive way uh, for defining and discovering APIs for developers so that they have everything available um, to, for example, consume internal APIs or get onboarded. In addition to that, it has a really huge plugin system so that you can um, provide integration points in all the different services you're using from observability, for example, to CI, CD into one portal so that developers only have that one place to go to experience everything. What's important to know is that Backstage is really, it was used by Spotify for a so-called golden path. And the idea was to have one, uh, all the documentation for everything in one place. It's also why they currently, in general, the, the ecosystem is working on providing proper rule-based access, because it was not meant to use for automation uh, like most of the companies are currently using it. And um, yeah, that's it for today. Um, you can see I only was able in those uh, 30 minutes to show you some of the uh, tools that are available. 
um, there are a lot more to really um, yeah, provide you a nice developer experience on top of Kubernetes. Like, for example, cry for CVE scanning. There's also Trivi or Sneak. Um, control and ingress controller of us. Kenico, if there's still the need to build some applications with Dockerfast. Crossplane, an amazing uh, solution, which also um, I think was presented in parallel to, for example, provision um, data services from your Kubernetes cluster that are outside of your Kubernetes cluster. Flux, I showed you a little bit of that for um, GitOps, and um, yeah, Carvel tools are tools from us uh, for the management of Kubernetes resources. And um, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining <laughs> my session.